Hello and welcome to the Beginner's Handbook. I'm Jordan. I'm Jamie. And in this episode, we are going to be talking about travelling in your tabletop RPGs. So, I think for this episode, we're just going to kick off with, well, first of all, anyone listening or watching, have you ever ever had a game where there was lots of travelling? If so, what was it like? Was it good, bad? Was there anything thrown in to make it feel unique? We'd love to know a wee bit more from the player's perspective, but... For those maybe that are running games, do you spice up your travel in a way that makes it unique or fun? Um, Mm -hmm. I myself, I'll get into the details later, but I'm not a big travel guy um, in terms of the games and things, but... Mm -hmm. Yeah, for me, I'm kind of 50-50, so it depends on what setting we're doing, depends on on how much I'm buying into it or not, but again, we'll kind of talk more in detail about that and... In a little bit, I think. Mm -hmm. Cool, okay then. So I think really in in this episode, we're just, just to give you an idea of what we're covering, uh, we've mentioned covering travelling, but it'll be things like, you know, what can travel do for a game? When is it or should it be necessary if you want to introduce it or if you don't want to introduce it? Maybe why you should aim for some of your games, Mm -hmm. which will be funny even though I don't tend to do a lot of travelling in my games, but I still think there's value in it, Mm -hmm. even though I don't personally use it quite a lot. Yeah, which Um, conveniently leads on as well to our personal experience with travel and we'll talk about, again, as players and then a little bit later on in that and then we'll talk about how we would run it or how we do run it. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, just our kind of general take on on travel as a whole. Yeah, I think that's pretty much everything. So yeah, that's it. So why don't we just kick in with you know what what can travel do for a game then, like for in your experience? Yeah. So I mean, travel. Do you know what? I should actually interrupt you. As I was introducing stuff, I've just remembered when we say traveling specifically what we're talking about because some games do uh, introduce traveling almost as part of the main storytelling mechanic and I'll cover some of that a bit later but there's games that are like literally the plot revolves around globe trotting right so it's not like that whole game's a big travel although I suppose technically it is but what is specifically we're talking about is the bits between maybe two objectives, you know, so anything that can happen between them, um, that's specifically yeah. what we mean by travelling. But anyway, sorry, Jamie, you were Yeah, saying. yeah, so basically just picking up from what Jordan's saying, so, and again, although you're talking about two objectives or going from point A to point B, you know, in general, we're not talking about you're leaving, if, if you're in a town, you're leaving from like a pub or a tavern in a town and you're 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 on a five minute walk down the street because you're trying to get to the local church or whatever and something happens that's not what we mean although that is traveling you're going from point a to point b and you've spoken to somebody which was your first objective and you're going to speak to somebody else which is your second objective in general we're meaning kind of bigger distances so whether Mm -hmm. that's town to town or city to city or country to country you know whatever it is it tends to be kind of larger journeys that you know if you put it in a sort of a real world context would take you know many 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 minutes of just pure traveling or hours or days weeks Mm -hmm. however long so that's kind of in general, I think what we mean by the kind of scale of it as well, I don't think anybody really counts travel, using the air quotes there, as um, you know, anything less than that, I don't think. Uh, it's a good point because there's a lot of games where you might find yourself kind of walking around a city, like you're mm-hmm. saying, and trying to figure out your objectives, or if it was Grand Theft Auto, you're going to be driving between, practically most of the games driving between objectives and fetch mm-hmm. quests and things like that. Um, or if it's in Red Dead you're jumping on your horse and now I suppose in that game you technically are travelling a long time I think most of my game of that was in the, on a horse pretty much I think most of the hours in that game was on horseback um, I wasn't a fan of that much of travelling but um, I so definitely it's worth just kind of saying that that's the scale of it it's not just your average just mm-hmm. kind of jumping about for between five minutes of walking to get to objectives it's, it's a bit grander scale yeah yeah. Um, so yeah uh, anyway so going into then what can it actually do for a game um, anything that you could want to bring up yeah so I mean for me 
traveling can be useful for for enhancing the story um, so if you are playing something that is in a more kind of realistic setting so for example if you are in a, like with Call of Cthulhu um, if it's in a 20s American setting and you're going again between cities or something like that then rather than being able to necessarily have fantastic public transport if you are in a rural kind of farming community and you need to go from point A to point B it could be a two hour walk if nobody has a car or you know the quickest way of getting there is on a horse or you know whatever kind of particular thing is happening with your story so given make, making the players travel and then takes a bit of time in the game which ultimately emphasises you know what the world's like rather than you know falling in the trap of you know you know jumping a car and you're there in five ten minutes or you know whatever you know whatever other situation or having you know fantastic public transport that does a a similar thing or you know whatever it is so you're kind of you're helping to get the players in that mindset by reminding them that they're not always just going to be able to get something straight away it's going to take a bit of time it's going to take a bit of patience and again if it's Cthulhu where you're wanting them to kind of do a bit more kind of detective work or or something similar then giving them that travel time allows them to kind of sit and digest events that have just happened or things that might be about to happen and it, it gives the players a little bit of breathing space so um so it it can kind of do two things there it can either help enhance your story by getting people in that mindset of that world and giving them that little bit of time or it can give the players a chance to digest different plot elements that you've introduced by just giving them a little bit of time just to kind of work through and think about things rather than always try to rush on to the next task or or some other event comes in and it you know, it stops them thinking about that and on to the next thing and, you know, getting detracted and going away. Yeah, totally. I mean, one of the things as well, like, in terms of, like, what other stuff it can do, like, especially when you speak about, um, when, when you're going back to the 20s and things yeah. when transport wasn't as accessible. I mean, one thing travel can be done for is to increase some of that immersion. I mean, that's, I mentioned Red Dead Redemption there too. Um, and that game, it's like, a very huge technical feat in terms of uh, as an immersive game you know there's so much content and detail in that game that you're never going to see really unless you're looking for it like you've got things even things like birds will come down and eat people you've shot and then their bodies will decompose and there's other stuff with horses in it that if you know you if you know you know um but there's a whole bunch of stuff in that game um, mm-hmm. even things that you do on so-called like offshoots or Meeting, meeting strangers which are random events in the game that just happen they're, they're kind of scripted events but they're random then they pop up every so often while we travel and sometimes you'll meet people that you've saved at different mm-hmm. points or if you kill an NPC and come back later you might hear something somebody talking about how there was one I'd seen the guy was like oh it should have been me that gets shot and all that I've, I've you know let my son and my wife down sort of thing so a hugely immersive game so it's, it's definitely one thing that if you are doing something where you're travelling was maybe a hardship in, mm-hmm. for example, the 20s, or even way before that, if it's even fantasy games really with a lot of travelling, mm-hmm. maybe with lo- low-level players that, that have no money and no skills to actually fly or jump on magic carpets like my guy. Um, you know, actually maybe having travel, at least during those stages and putting a focus on how difficult it can be, can really help increase some of that immersion. Um yeah, I think it's it's a good. I think that's actually a good example of, of using travel to to enhance your games. Is there any bad examples actually that you've maybe came across? I'm just I'm thinking about some myself, but yeah. you, you, that you've the least experienced. Is there any travels you've went? Oh God, I I don't think there's anything that I think's been done particularly poorly. You know, yeah. I don't think there's anything that I've done that I've went. This just doesn't make any sense, you know how, you know how's person A managed to get there on, you know the back of 
a donkey quicker than that other person there that's used the train and it's across three countries. You know, magic donkey, that's why. Magic donkey on steroids or, yeah. or something. Um, no, I, I don't think there's anything that's ever been done that's been done bad, but there's been games where it's, it's, it's just been a bit relentless and because of that it's just the repetition of mm. of the same tasks um, so I, as an example in, in D&D one of the things you can do is a survival check and one of the, the kind of offshoots of doing that is that you can use that for navigation whether you're successfully getting from point A to point B and you know through a forest or or whatever, or whether you're finding yourself enough food when you're on your journey yeah. of however many days, weeks, months, whatever, um, and, and so on and so on. So, like if you're, like if you're breaking that down so that, like, okay, it's a new day, so roll a new survival check for your food, roll a new survival check for your water, roll a new survival check for the navigation to, you know, the next part of the forest right okay it's lunchtime so roll it for your foot and you know and it, it just repeats and repeats and repeats and it it layers and it layers and it layers and ultimately you're you're doing the same thing over and over and over and over yeah. and again that might be good for emphasizing how long a journey's taken or it might be good for you know making you think that you know this is a serious situation and that you're in because you're lost in the woods and you need to survive to get back home but at the end of the day you've still got a group of people there that are wanting to be playing a game and are wanting to enjoy it and be entertained and relax at the end of the day so doing the repetitive task over and over and over again isn't necessarily going to help them do that yeah do you know that's something that it's maybe something I'll cover in a different area because the stuff around like role fatigue mm-hmm. that I think it's very clear um, because the thing I always ask myself when I'm building stuff if it's a hard encounter if there's lots of bad guys or multiple fights I'm not a fan of like game long fight scenes for example unless there's a really good reason for it mm-hmm. um, because I mean most of the time if your guys are all at level 10 in D&D you'd think they could wipe out some guys that are trying to rob them on the road, you know. But I've ran games where actually they've been super souped up. And that's what, looking back, there was no reason. Um, and that was an event that happened when they were travelling. Because um, you spoke about there, you can roll mm-hmm. for food, roll for finding your way, but there's even random events. Now, I'll maybe cover like where I've seen that used in more detail a bit later. Mm-hmm. But I, one of the things, is even just when you're running games... It, Certainly something, with everything, not just travel, but it's going, well, can that be condensed down if you think it's going to take a lot of time, mm-hmm. like doing all those sort of checks? I've, I'll, I'll talk about that example in a minute, but um, certainly if you think they're going to be doing, or the players are going to be doing six or seven consecutive checks to get out of somewhere... You know, I, I, I'm i kind of like, well, you could just turn that into one group check, you know, probably and just explain the rest. Or if you want to give people information, almost to reward them or maybe not quite punish them. But even if they fail the role, like you can still be giving them hints about stuff and mm-hmm. then do other checks. I think if there's going to be lots, it should there should be something between them. And I've been and the reason I say that is I've, I've been in games where roles have just come one after another, like constantly. And it kind of loses the fun because when you get asked to do a check, like first roll of the game is always fun. People go, mm. hey, oh, and they throw it and then they suck, their rolls to crap. Um, which is why I moved to doing a lot of Call of Cthulhu because low's better, always. Um, but like you want rolling to mean something ultimately and that's where mm. when you're doing it and travelling, it's hard to make it work very well and we'll cover what we at least think might help make it better. But you know, sometimes I've I've seen it where traveling's been almost in an attempt to augment it. Mm-hmm. Kind of superficial roles have been introduced. Like it makes sense, you know, for survival. I understand that, but quite often what I do in these cases is if someone's proficient in it and they've got a high skill, then I can Sometimes I don't even do roles and things, mm-hmm. and even survival checks to find a way. If somebody's proficient and they're a ranger, and maybe they 
they, they have good survival and maybe mm. they're proficient in survival then I kind of try to circumvent all of that stuff and actually replace it with character stuff and I introduce it like stories and things um, although I'm kind of getting ahead of myself in terms of um, how to spice it up so I'll circle back to that later mm-hmm. um, but yeah in terms of a bad example um, of travel and I had a game was it this week? no it was it was two weeks ago and uh, man, the guy's good at running games he's definitely I quite enjoy the games that I've done with him um, but the, it was one of these one shot things it was to wrap up a bunch of stuff we'd done and it was supposed to be in the future so some, there was some big plot reason why we ended up being a year ahead in time and being level 14 and not whatever we were 7 or 8 7 because we're level 14 and uh, I don't, basically because it's a shame because you, we try and finish up quite tight those games it's middle of the week you know, it was actually the start of the week it's on, it's on Monday nights so, I mean, most of his work, you know, at least I, I work and I, I think I get up the earliest anyway to work, but definitely a couple of the others there uh, get up early to work, at least most Mondays, uh, most Tuesdays. So we don't want to run on dead late. In between mm-hmm. that, I'm already playing a run in another two or three games, you know, during the week. Um, actually, not recently, because I've been off with our, our mm-hmm. games um, yep. in the last few weeks. But... Um, I so but that game basically revolved and I knew it was coming and I was like oh no he's done this because I knew combat was going to happen and that was going to take forever um, but it was literally like everything's collapsing the, the apocalypse has come there's lava everywhere it was probably some Baldur's Gate type thing and for those that don't know what that is it's kind of like, like a hell type environment a hellscape there's this big I think it's a big black gate. I actually don't know much about it myself. But um, lots of demons and fiends and all that kind of good stuff. So it was kind of like that there where it was a normal village getting burnt to burnt the ground, burnt mm-hmm. to a crisp. And it was there was a big black dragon flying everywhere. Like when he's, you know, an ancient dragon. It was the one that spits acid, whatever that one is. Which, wow. Yeah, which was in the D&D trailer for the movie. Um, and... Uh, anyway, so that was flying overhead. It was like a constant threat. But it was basically, do a roll, do this, do that. And it was like, you do a roll. You walk up. And it's like, okay, you've successfully stealthed. Great. Do a roll to get to the next bit. And you see the increments it was in. It was like, yeah, the guy had a full map. It was probably like 20 or 30 tiles or something. And it was like doing 10 diagonal. So really five vertical movements. Like every turn, every check. I'm just like come on and it went on all and I did my best to like speed run most of that I was doing stuff I was trying to get the dragon's attention so I could like die or something it was in the future so I was happy dying if it meant that we're actually getting to the next bit um, and man it literally I think it was an hour and a half to get across this village or well we played for three so it was actually probably closer to two hours you know and it was like it just wasn't fun the thing is we rolled really well you know and there was a couple of things the guys the guy done to try and augment and make it fun and kind of little puzzles along the way, but it just was far too it long. It just fell flat. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas really the first six checks could have been one check to get us to the puzzle. You know, he could have just made it, if he was desperate, he could have made it harder. You know, mm. but that's an example. Like that ended up being two hours of literally the whole point was getting across a town. Yeah. And I get there was it was supposed to be challenging, but it just became literally two hours of travelling. Um, yeah, mm-hmm. two hours of travelling. And it was a shame because the guy's game actually after that was really good, but man, I was losing the will to play it. I was mm-hmm. man. Yeah, yeah. So in that kind of circumstance, like again, if there's a dragon flying about and it's spitting acid out and things, so rather than, oh dear, there's now a big puddle of acid, you need to figure out how to navigate that. And it being about completing that task is mm-hmm. the thing that's taking you the time it's literally just right moving from here to here roll check right okay yeah here to here roll check right okay and then repeat 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 yeah to the point that the challenging parts of it become a slog rather than something that's getting your getting your problem solving part of your brain going and yeah. trying to figure out what's going on it just becomes like a kind of right okay yeah don't get yeah. me wrong I mean the guy did did include little challenges which were kind of good to do but like you're saying like it got to I think by an hour in it was kind of like man, just like I want to get through this 
so when the challenges are coming up, you're kind of already done with them in your head. Like, because mm. that's what I thought I was hoping. Although I know the guy, so I was a bit like, oh no, it's gonna be like what it became. But um, I was kind of hoping for these different challenges and things. I mean, there's a couple of really funny moments during it as well. And so it wasn't literally just rolling for two hours to travel. But I mean, most of it pretty much was, you know, so it was, it was a shame, but it was otherwise a very good game, but it, it shows you like, part of his, I think maybe too far, almost they went in, we spoke about immersion and how it can add to immersion and clearly there was, there was that desire to, to add to immersion and things. Um, but it was almost like it was too much. It was almost forgetting the kind of other part of it, which is we're also just trying to sit and play a game. At least that's my yeah. me, kind of ethos about them, mm-hmm. um, which we may or may not have spoke about in an episode either already or going to. Um, we'll see when whenever this one gets slotted in. Yeah, yeah. Um, kind of going back to that thing of if you if you put more in, then you're giving your players more content, which is is good. That will keep them engaged not always necessarily the case because you can run into, like you're saying a player that's going right, okay, this is pretty much the same thing that we've done 10 minutes ago and I need to do it again and they're sitting there and they, they don't feel like they've made any any progress they just feel like they're again doing the same thing over and over again so they just end up getting a bit bored or disillusioned or you know tired mentally uh, through repeating a task so more isn't always necessarily a good thing yeah and you know we've actually came across this exact thing in the dwarf game where Mm -hmm. I've stated it multiple times not like to say to the the GM like ah this is rubbish it's nothing like that it's just more I've made like the joke and comment where we've played this two year long campaign and it's taken us a year and a half to not even get halfway through the map, you know. Now, or maybe about halfway through the map, you know, because it was from the start to. I think we're, I think we're just halfway, but based on the rate that we were moving and progressing, if you hadn't made a comment like that, then I reckon we wouldn't be getting to the halfway point until the kind of. Year three. <laughs> I genuinely don't think it would have been far off that. I, know. I was going to say between two and a half and maybe two and three quarters, three. I mean, but that's the thing where... So a big part to give people context if you've not heard the, the podcast before, um, it's a game where basically we're trying to take back our dwarven homestead and all that. So we're a travelling barbarian camp, effectively. We're going from... I think we were off the map and then we got onto it and then we're part of this big yeah. world map. Um and the thing is, it's just been part of it. Now, it's, it's by no means a judgment on the on the GM at all. The guy's been very um, he's through. It. It's one of these. He's one of the guys who'll put something nice and shiny there, and he just knows. He knows that I'm going to say, ah, let's check it out." <laughs> only be only take ten minutes. Cut to three games later, you know. But um, I so but that's where I think at that point where we're at one of the sub villages or something or kind of near that road that makes us travel faster mm-hmm. and I just said like the players so it wasn't a thing to the GM like it was more to us like we need to just get on this road that will speed it up and get moving because that's been all this time you know mm-hmm. um, so I but actually I actually found I enjoyed it better when we started moving because it was a thing where it became a bit like travelling if you're not careful, it's good for immersion, which is clearly what the guy was going for with this. You know, yeah, yeah. even one of the other player characters was based off of Red Dead. Now that I'm thinking about it, um, but it was all about increasing immersion. Um, so we've kind of spoke about all the bad stuff first, but I suppose it's better to get get them out of the way, um, because it just took too long. You know, mm. not it, it's more hindsight that's revealed that rather than it being at the moment. But there was times I was just like, oh god. Every time I looked at the world map, I'm like, we've barely even moved. Um, and I'm sitting going, man, just, it's too much. And it, it just suffered. <coughs> Sim- similar thing, I think, to the guy that I just spoke about I played last week, yeah. with, or two weeks, whatever I said, because I can't remember exactly when it was. Um, but I, it was just like, it was just too much of that particular thing, which was travelling. 
Um, and to, to the guy's credit with the dwarf stuff there was a lot of cool things we could do along the way and a lot of nice little memorable adventures that had mm-hmm. happened which I can't say had happened last week but um, the difference was our guy was you know that's a, a big campaign he's running the guy last week was run, running a one shot you know so we've probably had games like that where it's felt like travelling I think there's been games I've separated or through narrative I've disappeared or travelled onwards uh, well, that's when the first character died. Actually, it was, I sat the whole yeah. game out. I think actually, so I decided to travel ahead. Yeah, no, that immersion. Was, <laughs> that I can't remember if it was you travelled ahead or if it was I can't we this. went ahead or you know, whatever the reason is, yeah. which isn't important. Jordan's character ended up split from myself, and it was the chameleon we were playing with. Um, ah, yeah. um, so we ended up split and I think in fact I think you did travel ahead because the point was, was you were going to we were going to make the camp there because we'd already been travelling and something chaotic had happened previously so we were going to make camp you were going to go ahead for a little bit check out the route see what you think because Jordan's character's a, a man of the wild so he was going to mm-hmm. cast his expert opinion over what was going to what the route was going to be and come back and let us know but little did he know um, a chaotic situation happened and the, <laughs> player the camp, ending character it, yeah, events it, happened as I left so yeah so, <laughs> <laughs> yeah so you were safe um, I was nearly not safe but ended up safe and uh, the chameleon you know that was character number one uh, in the bin for him so again that's that was part of that whole kind of travelling sequence that yeah. I think kind of primarily because we, we were looking at the situation and travelling and we put too much of an emphasis on the travel part that we kind of ended up splitting up from where the yeah, kind of main so. task was going to be which was actually in the camp and not on the road itself um and again, just touching on that campaign that, um, again, immersion and, and things like that. So the, the DM for it, again, there's, like, we've, again, if you've listened to stuff before, we've, and we've talked about it, there's, you know, there's hand-drawn map that we're using just mm-hmm. now. There's, you know, every single place that you visit will have, its backstory there and then how it relates to different other places in the world. The world is completely his own mm-hmm. and you know the, the level of detail is, is amazing. It's incredible. Yeah. Aye. It's you know, it's like every time when you, you think you've kinda of got to the bottom layer and you're like, right, okay, that's us, we've <laughs> we've got to the centre of this now. There's you know, there's always more and more there. So because of that, then th- the travel part when we're going along it, it feels sometimes that it's it's travel just for the sake of travelling because you're on the map which is supposed to be kind of a, a continent's worth of space mm. so yeah okay it will take a long time but rather than condensing the travel down by saying right you've been on the road for two weeks at this point and something happens it's like you're you're going day by day by day, um, and again, like when we've been traveling along. Although we want, like the kind of the main goal, the main task is to get back to our home city and reclaim it. So although that's the main task, we all know that we're going to have to kind of build an army as we move. We're going to have to do lots of other things in order to do that. We can't just you know, turn up, chat at the door and, you know, go, right, this is ours now, like, give us. So we know that there's there's going to have to be progress made along the way. So when we're travelling from point A to point B to point C to point D to eventually get back home, to me it's not the travelling part because the travelling part, you're going between locations where you can make contacts where you can sell stuff and generate money where you can you know do all sorts of things and it feels occasionally with that game that 
the the focus has been specifically on the travel mm-hmm. rather than the events that happen along the journey. So like turning up to village A and then you go right, okay, well you get you get food, you get water, you sell a couple of things, you buy a couple of things, you're there for a day, you know, somebody's goats went missing or whatever and you know, you you find it and then right, okay, that's fine, on you go. And then it's like roller survival check, roller survival check, and then that part drags until you can get to the next bit where you can kind of have a bit more freedom and kind of explore the towns and kind of get to grips with the kind of unique culture that's supposed to be there and, you know, that mm. that sort of a thing. So it feels that that, the, that to give us the sense of scale, to give us the element of travel, that the focus has shifted so much towards the journey that the kind of the, the different places along the way of of get lost you know it's like when somebody goes backpacking in like Australia or you know Southeast Asia or whatever they, they never come back and they go oh yeah it was amazing yeah do you know do you know every single day I done 25,000 steps it was amazing and then one day, phew, done 30. You know, nobody ever comes back and says that. They go, no, I went to like Kuala Lumpur and I was here and I was here and I was there and mm-hmm. there's this place, oh, look at this mountain over here. You know, they're showing you places, things. They're talking about events that happen. And they might talk a bit about the travel if it's something particularly interesting or significant. Or happened. bad. Or bad. <laughs> I've yeah. heard a lot of bad travel stories as well. Yeah, that, that, that was the way I was dressing that up. Yes. Interesting. Um, you know, but ultimately that's the thing because nobody comes back and talks about how difficult the journey was. They talk about, you know, what they've achieved by going on that journey, you know, the places they've seen, people they've met, you know, and things that they've done. Not... Uh, yeah, it took me three days to get here. Yeah, and the thing is, what I do wonder though is, I'll, I'll go into details about travel in different game systems later. But like for this particular story, just maybe to help set more context, and um, it's based off of uh, strongholds and followers, which looks like it's got some interesting little mechanics in it and things. Mm-hmm. But maybe that I, I do kind of wonder if that. Leans because it leans towards more hardcore. For example, a short rest is eight hours, not one, and a long rest is seven days, not eight hours. Um, so everything's like super more hardcore mm-hmm. and just all of that stuff. So I wonder, you know, sometimes the systems themselves can be like that. So maybe that's the part why it's like that. And um, but certainly, like travel can like it helps be immersive. It helps maybe even set up the world. And maybe even doing the travelling can help introduce, like you mentioned, the cultures. Like, you can introduce that as part of travelling. But I think with this particular example, that's kind of get lost because the focus was on the travel parts. Yeah. And less about those kind of key points that we, we've mentioned a wee bit and maybe breaking mm-hmm. into a bit more later. Uh, it's only something I've just realised talking about mm-hmm. it now because at the time I was just like, right, when's the next time? You know, there were some games I was like, okay, whatever. Like, just... Just like watch stuff like particularly that game used I went and travelled for a bit and then it was like nothing's there. I just went, oh, I'll just wait for them then because I think I think it was supposed to come up late. I think it were wait. I was staying the night mm-hmm. ahead or something. Yeah, yeah. So I was like, I'm just I'm not travelling back, I can't be bothered doing more checks, so just wait. And then all this stuff happened and someone died and it was traumatic and then it's like they all come up later on and I'm sitting going, Where are they all? <laughs> you know, um turns out they were dead. That's what it was. First character death in that campaign. Mm-hmm. Um, probably a while ago. It was. I don't think that guy lasted long either. I'm sure that was. I can't remember. But um, um, three, I, but this four is, games, maybe. It's kind of hard to remember because you know we've spoke about this before, but we're currently on a pause with that um, campaign just to kind of check out new games and, and just mm-hmm. do other stuff for a wee bit as well. Because I'll tell you something: the, the GM that's been doing it must have. A strenuous time going through. I mean, I'd ran a game for a year and I wasn't struggling, but you see, when I actually took a break and paused that, mm-hmm. like to let people do their own games, because it turns out everybody's now obsessed with wanting to run a game, which is awesome. Um, I've went, I don't need to prep anything. This is great. 
it just it's weird because I've done it for a year and that's on top of the other games I still run you know um, but I yeah so I think then in terms of why else could it be necessary then so we spoke a wee bit about kind of travelling for the sake of it like mm-hmm. sometimes it's good it is sometimes good just to in terms of scale we've mentioned this just with this, yeah. this particular story it helps just iterate how big it is um, you might even want to iterate it because maybe it's actually a huge challenging part of the day to day life of people in this world regardless of the system you know mm-hmm. um, we spoke about 1920s Cthulhu but maybe even uh, much earlier if it's um, Down Darker Trails which is the western themed Cthulhu games um, or well, uh, practically any fantasy game um, Pathfinder does tra- I think there's different rules for travelling in Pathfinder but I've, I've not read enough about it to know yet I've not ran it yet Um but yeah, so we've talked about it maybe being good for setting up the scenes and things. Uh, is there any examples for why you might introduce it in a more realistic setting at all? Yeah, well, I kind of touched on it a little bit earlier. But, and again, we'll kind of talk about what we kind of feel in more detail in a little bit as well. But for me personally, one of the reasons where I would go out of my way to do checks during travel and kind of break the travel down into more detail would be in a more realistic setting so again talked about earlier on you know in the 20s with Call of Cthulhu possibly being an option for doing that because it's real world and because it's a different time period from the period that you know we're all in just now then doing that might be something to do but with that as a setting and with that as an example if you are in a kind of suburban town and you know the America somewhere or the UK or you know wherever else then you go well you've probably got similar-ish facilities and things kicking about to what you would have in terms of today in a suburban type Mm -hmm. town so you go right well okay cars will be less common but you still might come across a car because in general people that were living in suburbs in the 20s had a bit more cash than Mm -hmm. people that were living in the middle of cities and small flats or, or, you know, anything like that. So, you know, you might still run into kind of, you know, some hint at what the future is going to be like. Whereas if you go even further back, so a game that I've not ran as of yet, um, because I've still got a couple of wee things I'm tweaking about in the background, um, is... Well, I'm, I'm planning to set that in the kind of 1300s, approximately. So, and what I'm planning on doing with it is setting it in, you know, our world, rather than any kind of fantasy type world or anything like that. So, real world, around about the 1300s. Am I getting a sneak peek? Uh, maybe. I'll plug my ears the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You, you leave the room. Yes. Um, so, um, with... With that, then you go, right, because it's real world, because it's the 1300s, and it's based on the kind of Knights Templar and kind of some of the myths, some of the kind of stories around that. So, you know, if, if you're in the middle of Jerusalem, then if you decide that you want to travel back from Jerusalem to whatever country your knight is from, if you're, you're playing a knight and all of that kind of thing, then you go, right, well, if that is from Jerusalem to the UK, then you go, well, in the 1300s, that's a journey over many months. You know, that's not going to be, you know, okay, well, hop on the flight four hours later, sorted. I do one check and you're done. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. So because that takes physically such a long time to do, and because you're not in a fantasy world where you can... I don't want to be kind of disingenuous when I say when you can make up a reason to speed up transport. I I don't mean that the way it might come across, but in a fantasy world, you've got you've got a bit more leeway. You know, you've got a potion that teleports you from point A to point B. You've got 
Um, one of the things that we had were giant mechanical bulls that were essentially like a train, basically, oh, yeah. if you remember I forgot, that. I yeah. forgot about that, yeah. Yeah, so, you know, that's, again, in this particular world that we are playing in with that campaign with the dwarfs. So, you know, you've got something like that that you can do so you can in- invent something to replace the convenience of the modern world. But if you're, if you're making it real world in the 1300s, then trains don't exist, cars don't exist, mm, horses and things, well, you need a bit of cash in order to have a horse and, and so on and so on. So you need to then either, if, if you fast travel it, and then, okay, you can still do that and you can alleviate some of the issues from travel that you might run into again repetitive checks and things or what you can do is go right okay well that journey in the real world would take four months so you as the gm are going right okay so what we'll do is i'll go right i'll split that into four games Mm -hmm. so that i'm still emphasizing that it is a journey it is a monumental task you can't just decide to do it on a whim if you want to do something like this but what I'll do is I'll speed up the travel to a kind of main village or city along the way and then I'll get them spending a bit of time there and then having to do the logistics of the next part of the journey and then I'll do the same thing a little bit further down or the the second game in I'll have an issue on the road to the city which then makes it a challenge to then get to that city you know the discover that one of the water flasks has actually got a hole in it so they've got you know however many litres less water so they need to navigate away to a source of water or you know they have to kind of barter with a local or you know whatever you know do something that involves a task and play the task out play the challenge out rather than roll right okay you've managed to find food and things so right okay you you're travelling on for another couple of days and right, do another roll for me. So rather than kind of rolling with no real description of what's going on and no real consequence, actually focus on a problem, a, a task, and then develop that and work that out and then speed up to the next sort of sensible point. Yeah, I think that's where the guy that I spoke about who had done... Um, it was that game... Uh, where everything was crumbling and travelled across the town it took two hours to get there no, th- he did bits like that where it's like here's a big key point and all of that but it was like between those key points it was like <laughs> just c- constant bombardment of rules and things like that you know so it did diminish it because really wh- why can it be necessary it is about increasing the mayors and it is about mm-hmm. adding challenge to the players it is about making for example the game that you're talking about then if you want to travel somewhere that's going to take four months then really what you would want to do is make it feel like a feat to get there. That's like a part yeah, of the reward yeah, yeah. for getting there in the first place. Now, I suppose you could still fast travel and stuff, but I would even say, similar to like how games, a lot of the way my brain works coming from a game design background, is you kind of go, like, how does it all work and how do you reward people for certain things? And even in Red Dead Redemption, speaking about that earlier, uh, you've got you don't get fast travel in that until a certain mm. point in the game. Uh, I wish they introduced it earlier because it's too it's too much for me personally. But um, but they do introduce fast travel later, you know. Mm. And I think there's probably games like if it's a fantasy game, you could go through like let's say it's level one players, so they can't they don't have money and stuff to get access to fast travel. And by the time maybe they make this massive feat and they're like, "Hooray, we got there!" Mm. Then you could have a teleportation circle unlock you know mm-hmm. so it's almost like there's your reward for going through a big feat um, which I think sometimes it's just when you're in the fog of war almost with it and you're, yeah. you know you're trying to make this a dramatic travel sequence mm-hmm. I think sometimes it can that sort of stuff can be missed um, I think realistic settings are actually good examples of that um, and that actually mm-hmm. talking about your Templar game um, that kind of leads us on to a topic I'll maybe circle back to later which would be um just like how it's used in other games and things like that as well mm-hmm. or well maybe it's worth actually bringing up now so I'll maybe bring up the first one what that leads into well but realistic environments is like Call of Cthulhu 
Yeah. Which is all about, um, you know, there's a lot of travelling. They've got, there's at least three campaigns that literally focus around travelling the world for, for however you do it. Now, some of them kind of, you finish the adventure and you go, you travel to the next part and it's like Act 3 and then you're in Egypt or or you're in some Amazon forest or something. So it's a bit more cut to black sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, because it's all it's like it's almost adding in artificial work or padding for that particular game because it's um it's called um The Two Headed Serpent, it's a pulp Cthulhu game. Um but I so there's different games that do travel and it's for that reason it's mostly it's about emphasising the grandness of this big adventure you're on and some of the other campaigns it's a bit more like emphasising the challenge of the whole thing although I've not played them but I, I know based on the bits I've read and watched that it's kind of like the bigger parts around it one of them called Horror on the Orient Express um, it's literally it's you're on the Orient Express and a whole bunch of stuff happens um, I think there's stuff to do with different dimensions and stuff I don't know I've not I'll maybe get it Although if we played it, I do know some of the guys that one of my family has, pl- has done YouTube videos before. Um, and I think the guys that it used to or still plays with have done the horror on the Orient Express. And it's like two years. And I don't think they'd finished it the last time I'd seen. So, mm-hmm. big. It's a big game. Yeah. But and it's all around travel. Cthulhu also has masks of um, Nylanthrotep. I think that's how you pronounce it. Um, and I'm pretty sure that's a big globetrotting one. Um mm-hmm. But we've also, we've spoke about, like, we've kind of gave a lot of our experience with D&D, I think, with travel. Yeah, um, yeah. But, you know, I mean, other, just to give, I'll maybe give you some other stuff as well, like Cursor Strad, which I've been running a lot of, like, a lot of travelling. It's a small world you're in, it's mm-hmm. a small kind of, I can't give you some idea, it's a small area you're mm-hmm. in. Um, or it's, well, it's fairly large, but it's not like the campaign size that we are playing with the dwarves. Um, but... Basically, some of the other stuff that we've got is we need to travel between all these different towns where all these cool events happen, and and basically stuff happens all the time. Um, but the guidance actually gives you on the GM screen that I've got for Curse of Strad. It basically says every thirty minutes of travel, roll on a table, mm-hmm. eighteen or higher, something happens. And you roll on a table, and you see during the day, I think, and then during the night and off road, I think it's like. 14 or 15 or higher so the chances of something happening become harder yeah uh, and no, if it's off road it's 15 or higher and at night you've got a night table to roll on dur- versus during the day and night it's much 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 worse like there's a lot of bad stuff that can happen at night in that game mm-hmm. so they actually use it as a mechanic to less to slow down the travelling between these key locations which Basically, if you've played Curse of Strad, you want to go to Strad and you want to kill him, probably. And that's your goal. And sometimes you meet him at the beginning of the game, which is what I've done for my players. And they knew exactly where to go. But with that game, you've got all these key locations that you can go to. Mm-hmm. Um, now, it depends how hardcore you want to be. I've seen a map online with times and stuff between locations. And you're speaking like four checks sometimes between it. Yeah. It's a bit much. But at least the, the kind of key events that, that are there are, are almost like narrative, little narrative experiences. Although if you bombard people with it too much, it just becomes a bit of a snore. Um, but I so but otherwise we've kind of covered other D and D stuff. But mm-hmm. that's like another example of how travel is used in, in things like D and D on top mm-hmm. of the stuff we've mentioned. Um, I wonder actually if you remember the game that we some of the. Have you played any of my Cthulhu games? Do you remember any traveling in it? I'm trying to. I thought there was one that had a lot of traveling, but I can't remember now. There was the, the forest one. Of, yeah, the forest one that you done. Um, was there a lot of traveling? I can't remember. It was so long. A bit of traveling um, because we had to travel. <laughs> Yeah, yeah okay. for, for the guy who doesn't like travel, everyone who's listening or watching. This it. is why I still so play We had travel. to travel from. Wherever our characters were from, so my character was from the states, moving from New York to like. Um, was it Norway? I said it. <laughs> no, it was it was in the states. Um, oh, it was Canada. It was in Canada, I think. Yeah, so from New York State to Canada, um, the. Chameleon, who was playing with us for that one, he had to go from 
one of the, the southern states, I can't remember which one, Texas or whatever, to Canada. That's right. And then the author, his character, came from Norway, so he had to come from Norway to Canada. So there's a lot of travelling going on over, you know, in, in my character's case, a few countries, realistically, for the chameleon's character, one continent, and then for the author's character as well, a, a continent and a, an ocean had to get crossed for him to turn up. And that was just to meet with the initial character who yeah. would then talk to us, who would then give us the task that he wanted us to complete. To be f- yeah, you which, first, I'll which then it. involved some more travel to a different location, all still within Canada, to then get to whatever point we got to, to then have to walk along a road and through a forest. I think that was because some issue happened with our transport. And then when we got to the place that we went to, we then had to explore that place, which then involved more moving around. So, Yeah, and while maybe that isn't technically travelling, I think the thing, because this was the first game I think I ran, I think it was actually the first ever one I ran, because it was the first one I'd written as well. Um, even though travelling between these different houses in the village isn't really a lot of travelling it's not like Strad it's like literally like it's a 10 minute walk but the problem is all of that's happening after you've done all of this precursory stuff um, and my issue was leaving it too open on reflection which was oh you can be from where you want what do you do when you get the letter and they get, they get this invite from mm-hmm. some big fancy guy that invites them to his big manor or uni or something like a university or something like that and literally, it took like an hour and a half to get past the letter. And it wasn't because of travelling, by the way, I will add. But it's my fault for having it in. But it was like, someone was like, I ignored it. And I was like, uh, how do I handle this? Like, they basically rejected it. They had a condition for the quote. I think they sent letters back and forth. Mm-hmm. So there was all this other stuff that I should have factored in. Um but I mean the whole introduction I think it took two hours to get go from the letter which was only to set the scene in my head at the mm-hmm. time and what a mistake I made um, but that was the introductory piece to go basically be I should have fast travelled to the guy um, instead of going through all the, the technical details of how you all get there really it should have been a case of how do you get there how do you get there how do you get there what's your thoughts cool mm-hmm. and then I just summarise it and that's it it takes five minutes and we're done um, but once you guys got there, there was you had to go speak to some guy at an asylum. And you had to travel there, and there was all there was all these other things. I don't think mm-hmm. there was any back and forth or anything. It wasn't like the first part, but I mean we'd already lost an hour and a half or something or two hours before mm-hmm. that point. Um, and I and then straight up the guy that was going to lower dump and give his answers. I think came one of our players just killed him, just killed him because he was insane. And I was like, well, I didn't see that coming. <laughs> Uh, but then so it was like all these different mistakes and this is where travelling can go wrong big time because it did go wrong at mm-hmm. least during that point um, but that's like an example where travelling might come in in Cthulhu it might be because you're doing these continent trails yeah. maybe you would execute it significantly better than what I did for that first ever game but uh, and I should have known better because I'd played it before although I'd never run one I, well I don't think I'd run one for anyone that wasn't like sort of like family like and stuff. Player, so it was like yeah. it was like who cares? You know, nobody really cared anyway. Um, but that's where maybe some of the examples of travel might come in. It might be because you want to figure out lo- the logistics. But I think the important things to make sure that there's an actual reason for it. Though if it's purely just to talk about logistics, which was kind of what I'd made the mistake. Well, it was mm. the mistake I made. Then I would say there's no point even having it in there. You know, yeah. just summarize it and get it over with. Yeah, and I mean ultimately, like for your story in that game whether somebody took a train to get there or they took a boat to then take two trains and a ferry and you know the details of it ultimately weren't important for the story because the story started from when we arrived and on yeah and the stuff before was just for for setting the scene for kind of getting people to sort of slowly kind of relax into the role play of it to introduce them to the game and you know other things because at that point we'd never played it before so it was to kind of introduce the system and things like that as well whereas from the point of 
meeting in the manor or the university, I can't remember uh, which it one it was. One of them. Then from that point onwards, any travel that was getting done was potentially important from that point, whereas the earlier part you go, well, yeah. Yeah, okay, totally it's agree. good for setting the scene, but other than that, it's not actually doing anything because nobody's nobody's going to get attacked during this journey because I we need of, uh, Maybe next time I'll kill you before the introduction. Um, he's asked too many awkward questions. He's getting poisoned in the train. I mean, t- to be honest though, this is the sort of thing where actually that mistake I made was probably in some. It's somewhat connected to the mistake that guy was speaking about that done the fight in the city. It was like mm. he's trying to give all this cool stuff when it didn't matter so much. Yeah. Maybe a bit of the trap that the dwarf stuff we were doing got into. Not yeah. intentionally. And it wasn't like it certainly wasn't a drag the way the thing up my stuff went. Yeah. Um, ultimately, it's. It's try to provide as much as possible, but the problem with that is that players I, just get bogged down. I more stuff doesn't always mean better stuff. Yeah, we spoke about overload. I think at mm. one point, and not in this episode, but um, overloads it's, it's a real thing, you know. So, yeah. and I think I probably tried to introduce rules and systems and all that before even using them. Mm. And in my opinion, there's no point. You know, just bring them in when you need them. Because um, even setting the scene, like I wanted to set the scene, but the scene setting didn't start until you met the guy, so I, pff, I'd already screwed up. And looking back, I should have, I would have shook myself, mm-hmm. shaking younger Jordan, and just said, just say, right, that's enough, I don't care about the reasons for you not doing this letter yet, just we're cutting, t- <laughs> just cut it short. It's okay to cut short, by the way. Mm-hmm. If either a, a player's making travel go on too long, if someone's like that didn't happen during this game, but there's there's players that I've had recently who want to inspect under every stone, and there's nothing there. So mm-hmm. if there's players that are maybe obstructing travel, or you as a GM have noticed that you're the reason for that, there's no harm in just saying like the rest of this traveling part, at least for this piece, isn't really significant. Just level with people, you mm-hmm. know, they will get it and they'll move on, and it will get you into the next cool thing. Um, but anyway, that's some examples of how Cthulhu does travel, and, and pretty much most of the time, it's similar to what happens in D and D, but there's maybe a bit more focus on traveling because it's more resource intensive in Call of Cthulhu for the most part. If you're mm-hmm. not taking trains, um, but I actually find in most games published and the ones I've written and played by other people, you find traveling most of the time is is basically summarized. Mm-hmm. and that's it and it's done or it's skipped entirely because it's not usually treacherous to jump in a train that travels for two hours south you know it's pretty much going to be okay and um, you might want to spice it up maybe you can use those times to spice things up but we'll cover that in a minute and um, i think the last one i mean i've got I've played so many systems but for the most part honestly i tend to skip travel or use it to mm-hmm. do something interesting less about random encounters more to do with narrative and, and things mm-hmm. like that um, and that leads me on to one called Morkborg um, which is so damn good I mean I, the more I've played it the more obsessed I get with it partly because it's just it appeals to the inner goth that disappeared that I thought I'd get rid of until playing Morkborg again but actually they take travel and make it quite interesting in terms of how it's done though in, in, in a game uh, it's it functionally works very similar to D and D and things like that. It's a fantasy game, after all. Um, it tends to be a bit more grim and grisly, so usually travel is a bit more bleak and depressing, or mm-hmm. people might be hanging from trees and all that sort of stuff. Um, but fundamentally, it's pretty much the same. <clears throat> so I think this really leads us on to spicing, spicing up travel. Mm-hmm. I'll maybe talk about more because then you went to add actually before I kind of. Hey, I'm aware no, I might uh, talk for a wee minute. <laughs> That's all right. Um, no, I think we've said quite a bit there, um, and just the different points that we've made as well about you know nine times out of ten, if you feel that you're getting bogged down in something, and that the GM's kind of keeping that going, nine times out of ten, it's because they themselves are trying to do the right thing by you as a player by giving you content giving you more content and it's it's not always again like we've said the best thing at, they might not even know they're point. doing it either and again yeah they yeah. not know that they're doing it so it's like the dwarf thing like we said earlier I mean I made the, rather than being a moan at the GM it was an in-character decision to be like look I don't care about this other stuff let's mm-hmm. just get going 
Um, and I think that what I ended up doing was that I think it, uh, hi- at least for me, it highlighted like actually we could have done this like seven or eight weeks ago and probably mm. got to where we got to before we paused, but like two or three months before the fact. Yeah. Um, but I so I think then in terms of maybe before I talk about spicing it up because that's like kind of important to to just cover it a wee bit as well as kind of what our take for traveling is. And I think mm-hmm. we've covered most of it and just to kind of wrap up the summary there. Um, I mean really. Do it however you want, but I would always say if you're going to have it, particularly if you're going to be, I mean, it's worth having it in there to do some random encounters, and I would do it behind your screen if you're running it. Do a couple of checks and make it difficult, like roll 15 or above, like a strad example, or 5 or below if you'd rather use the lower end scales to punish people for, you know, or have something happen. But, you know, roll those just, and you can ask players to do it, or you're as well just doing it. Um, and then actually introducing your random encounters along the way good way to pad games I would add mm. although uh, too much of anything can be too much of whatever it is you're giving mm. it um, but I've used it a lot of the time like interruptions of travel to int- for new players to introduce new players mm-hmm. either, sorry new characters or to introduce new players who've never played before so I design an encounter f- with them in mind so they can learn some of the rules in a way that's a bit more organic um, it's a good way to do it, but if you're going to do anything like, or use lots of it, or go into tons of detail, it's worth just making sure there's a reason for it, whatever that might be, it might be a narrative piece, you might want to have some lore dump happen along the way, you know, maybe they've met an NPC that actually just turns out to know that that secret black stone that they've got is actually a key to the other realm or something, you know, give, make sure there's a reason, because uh, if you don't, and there's a lot of travelling in your game, and you're padding, basically artificially padding with encounters, mm-hmm. it will get stale, which is what happened to, to me with the game a few weeks ago, two weeks ago or last week. It's happened to us with the Dwarf game that we've, we've spoke about a lot. So I would just say that's basic guidance. Um, mm-hmm. I So I think that leads us on to spicing it up. Yep. And, and I spoke <laughs> about Morkborg. So one thing that Morkborg does, while it's pretty standard people tend to be a bit more scared of traveling in the game because quite often your characters have less than four hit points and almost everything you fight will have at least double that um, it's a very asymmetric in terms of difficult uh, difficulty game uh, in the favor of the enemies although it's a game that rewards creative playing like a lot mm-hmm. i thought it'd be way too hard and then i'd get totally screwed up in that game so many times as a gm i was happy but i was like well it turns out this wasn't a challenge at all um, but one thing they do that makes um, travelling super unique, and I just wanted to kick off with this rather than just our, any of our opinions, because I think it's so cool. In Markborg, you've got something called the Calendar of Necrobell, which is effectively a collection of psalms that is similar to Bible psalms that talk about the, the end times and the, the mm-hmm. coming of the end. Uh, and you do roll for that, almost like a random encounter table. Mm-hmm. Um where you roll, you get different dice that you get to select, you get a d2, d4, d6, and it kind of goes up, depending on the length of game you're playing. If it's a one-shot, you do a d2. Regardless of the dice you roll, if you roll a natural one, a new, a new day of the apocalyptic calendar um, kind of proceeds, and then that's when you roll in the, the, the psalm table and you, you read out a psalm. It's a very unique way. While it, it might not technically have a lot of in-game impact really the whole point of it is it's about flavour of the world you know to give you an example there's one about uh, the rich becoming poor and the poor are becoming poorer still once that happens that might be day one of the apocalypse and day two might be um, I won't go into some of the darker ones but the like the, the, the the ground becomes warm in the graves and graves and the, the, basically zombies rise up and all of that, mm-hmm. which is what happened in the last game I ran for it. So, cool, it's more like a little narrative piece that you roll at dawn each day, so travelling overnight or sleeping in things, you get to roll this and get a chance of getting these calendars kicking off. And it's cool because you get to read them out and players go, oh, that's cool, and we're one step closer to the apocalypse. You've got seven days, and then the seventh day, it's the end of your game. So just a heads up, if you get seven days, you're not finished. Well, you are finished. You don't get a choice. That, that's Mark Borg's kind of style. So, 
Anyway, so these examples are pretty cool because it's narrative flavour, but what it actually does is it lets you summarise travel in a way that you can bring in these little flavours and it makes it feel like a very dynamic world. And like one of my tips is when you're doing travelling, it's usually worth summarising it rather than making stuff happen and you can use that as a chance to bring in cultures you might be travelling past. If you're not maybe engaging with them, you might want to describe the cultures if players are going from one continent to the next and they get a flavour for the new areas, which could have happened in the Dwarf campaign. Mm -hmm. I don't think it really did, but there was times we got to almost like Middle Eastern stuff. It was kind of like forests and moved to Middle Eastern style world. There there wasn't really a transition we got other than visiting towns. Mm -hmm. Um, But, I mean, you can introduce all that sort of flavour during your summaries, and Markburg's great for that. However, what you can also do with that sort of system is, and I'm thinking of doing one for D&D whenever we do stuff, but you can actually use it to introduce if you're doing a random encounter. It can be it can be related to that event that happened in the apocalyptic calendar, you know. So I had zombies attack the player during the night, or maybe not attack them, but I had them wake them up. And I go, what's that? Oh, and they go up and go, that's a guy who's watching us, and they go and poke him and all that, and they try and eat them. And then they realised they clicked at that point. Wait, you said a a zombie. And then they they used their torch to look and then they seen all these zombies were chasing after them very, very slowly because it took them like a long time. So I didn't make a whole battle sequence because I didn't didn't really care. I just wanted to add some flavour. Like this is now the world that you're in eh, and it's now much more dangerous. So the players decided just to haul their ass out of there basically. Um, The zombies, I just made them so slow they'd never catch up. But classical zombie rather than this yeah, the sprint. postmodern sprinters. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I think that's like a, an example of how like Markborg's an amazing, amazing creative system. But they use this calendar of Necrobell as a cool backdrop. But actually, having something like that in your games, regardless of system, could spice it up. Mm-hmm. You know, and it might make you consider that if you have something happen, whether you're doing a thematic game or something, if you want. It's maybe better to introduce a theme that occurs rather than always just having bog standard table events that happen. Mm-hmm. Or if you like tables, make a, a table of themes that might come up and actually use that to, to describe the next scene and then maybe start introducing encounters related to that later on. Mm-hmm. Um, because I can tell you when the players realised it was to do with the, the end times, they were just like, oh crap. <laughs> um, and it was cool. It just it made it a lot more of a cohesive game. It felt much more put together and for those that have maybe played or read Morkborg at least um, uh, the Rockback Sludge or the Accursed Den is the name of the game in the base book um, which is what I ran and done all this stuff in you know that's basically all tables the game is almost entirely made of tables and things so it's not like a D&D module where mm. it's all very cohesive and narrative and written it's a game you can literally look at I roll on a table and then go cool this is what's happening um, so it's not it's nowhere near like some other campaigns you've played, but it felt like a cohesive campaign based on all these cool little extras they had. So I would say that's one way to try and spice up a game, and it's such a cool th- idea using that. Mm-hmm. So I'm definitely going to be doing that in some of my other games. Um, have you got any ideas to any suggestions for spicing up games? Yeah. So again, kind of touched on it a little bit um, earlier on, but. Sticking with the example of the the game with the Templars, then, well, again, because it's realistic, er, not realistic, because it's set in the real world mm-hmm. and set during a time period where travel was difficult, then for me, rather than going, right, okay, do another check, see if that works, do another check, see if that works, do another check, see if that works, to emphasise the difficulty the plan is that if the players choose to travel, because I'm not going to make them travel, um, it's going to be based on what they want to do, so it's going to be quite kind of loose in terms of whether you're staying in one location or whether you're moving and if you do choose to move locations well are you going like to the next village or to the next town or the next country or whatever but if they do choose to go on a bigger journey mm-hmm. um, then at that point what my plan is for that is to give the players the choice of route so 
if it's again to the next village for an example you go right well there's the main road which is going to be a bit safer because it's a main road so there's going to be more people traveling but it's going to be a bit longer it's going to take more time or you can take this shortcut here but there's less people there which means it's more dangerous to travel along and you might get ambushed along it and you know other dangers but I'll point out what the dangers might be at the time for the route and then I'll point out the kind of benefits so you might have a safer route and a route that isn't so safe mm -hmm. and then let the players decide what to do so you've got them with a little bit of thinking time beforehand mm -hmm. so they're physically planning out their journey albeit you're only giving them a choice between two things the quick and dangerous way or the safe and a way that's going to take a bit of time um, so you're, you're only giving them that that choice of two things but they're involved in the planning of the journey and then if they're picking the longer route then at that point you go right okay well you can speed things up but you go right okay so it takes it takes all day to get there and blah 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 or if they go the quicker way then that ambush triggers and they have to fight to survive or fight to keep their possessions but they get there in half the time yeah it'd be interesting to see how especially after doing some of these podcast episodes how mm -hmm. it might impact it might be worth maybe talking about it at some point either on um, on the podcast or not just about how your approach might have changed since your last game you've done because mm -hmm. certainly that's something that giving players those choices can be quite good one thing I would actually say that I've experienced and I've skipped I think there's value in it where it's not really the same thing that you're mm -hmm. talking about but I've had games where it's like oh you've came to a roadblock or you've came to a bridge that's broke what do you do in d d it's not quite like fast yeah, yeah, yeah. it. it's kind of like oh what's the problem um, to be honest I've found that it's sometimes good to do the chats but I actually found this is less about space. this is more like my take on how to do the travelling but where I actually found games where situations like that where there was actually only one route like so if, see if there's only ever one thing that you give players mm -hmm. the option to do when they're travelling I would actually go as far to say just summarise it and tell them what they do unless you can, you can probably gauge it though see what your players want to do um, because they might say oh, I want to rest here if they rest then let them probably do it make, make their decision up but you're probably better summarising it. When when Jamie's mm. talking about two two bits or two paths, if you're going to give people options and things, mm. it's definitely worth covering and letting them ha have something unique for each way uh, or have something that is seemingly unique for each way. Mm. If it looks like the slow route, they might go, okay, cool, that's fine, it's slow, but it's safer, and then they get jumped by a Yeti or yeah. something. <laughs> go the fast route it might be more dangerous oh there's a yeti what a surprise we should have went the slow route we wouldn't have seen a yeti there's loads of ways that you can you can kind of get all your stuff yeah, in yeah, it yeah. just maybe means that they're less maybe they maybe they get exhaustion for the slow route sort of thing there's loads of things you can add um, to make it fun and interesting yeah, and that's well, an example of it yeah well again not <laughs> not as much in the kind of yeti route but so the yeti is not fun no no yeti is fun but I just don't think you'd see a yeti in the middle of Jerusalem in the 1300s if that's that's what you're doing. Why, um, San Jetty? Is a sand in Jerusalem? A San Jetty will do. Yeah, why not? But um, but I, another thing with travel, just kind of like what mm -hmm. you're touching on, if it's a group of players that know you, then if you present them with one option, which is, yep, it's a main road, so less likely to get ambushed. There's plenty of people along the way if you somehow run into trouble and it's actually the quickest route to get there. Or there's this other route which not a lot of people take and is a bit dangerous and they'll actually add time on. Then if it's a group that you're used to playing with, then they'll all be sitting there going, hang on a minute. Why does that route seem so, so, so much better than that one? Uh, and, it, you know, chances are they might overthink it, which again is trying to get them to do a bit of problem solving. And okay, you can let that run too much and too far and it can detract yeah. away from the game, but... You know, sometimes giving them a good option that is so obviously good might make them pick the opposite choice, might make them pick the wrong choice. You know, again, using air quotes there. Then, yeah. but 
you know, at the end of it, then you go, no, no, it's perfectly fine. It was just, I was trying to give you a way to kind of speed up things, but you, I don't know why you went the dangerous route. How yeah. mysterious. I mean, we've probably done that exact thing for the Dwarf oh, yeah, campaign. Oh, yeah, we definitely have. Um, on, on more than one occasion. <laughs> at least that probably been the reason. Ah, screw it, let's do it. Um, and then you end up in a lot of trouble. Mm. Um, but certainly, like, one thing I've seen as well that I've personally done, because I tend to try and narratively summarise travel, because there's always, like, 50 things that they could do that I'd rather they get to. Um, one thing, like, to use that more dangerous route, route that's faster versus the one that's slower, you know, what I'll maybe actually do is, sometimes I'll even just say to players, because, mm. you know, if it's a case where I'm not going to throw an encounter, I might want to, but if I've decided that I don't want to have an encounter regardless of the route... You know, I've had things where it's like, okay, if you go the slow route, you'll use double your resources pr- mm-hmm. approximately. You know, so if they're, if they're tracking resources, which I often don't do, just because people are drinking a lot and I know they're not taking off their resources. But I might just summarise that they use more. They might lose a couple of their party, not their like core party, but maybe their group that they're travelling with. Um, so there's ways that you can summarise that too. But I would even say that one of the last things there, there was something you said about Smile, come back to me. Um, but I so one of the other things I think maybe my last thing for this would be like one thing I've used travel a lot for. Um, I've just remembered the other thing, so I'll go back to that. But I've used travel a lot for. Um, like I've mentioned like narrative things or unique little stories that I can tell. What I tend to do quite a bit, especially with Cthulhu or anything that's more cosmic like Cult or even for Morkborg or even D&D for Magic, like maybe if there's mm-hmm. a, th- a looming threat, you know, it's kind of like Sauron and the Palantir and all that, like bringing in some of that stuff. Um, where I'll maybe use traveling as a sequence that maybe actually they're traveling but nothing really happens or maybe they'll see these ominous omens in the sky, similar to the purple storm that we seen one time yeah. which was really cool and actually it wasn't an encounter but it was cool it, it really set up that whole environment mm-hmm. but we never really had any of that environmental storytelling after that yeah um, it's kind of there and yeah it's a shame actually it's, it's, I've just realised because I do a lot of environmental storytelling just because I think it's an easy way to summarise travel and give players a, a unique little experience but again like if you go right, if, if you're going from an area which is like a jungle to an area which is like a grass plains to an area mm-hmm. that's like a desert, then you go, well, it's three completely different environments that are going to have three completely different types of weather, which is three completely different temperatures, which is, and, and so on and so on and so on and so on. So going through those different areas, then if you spend a bit of time talking about the environment then it emphasizes that you've that you have been traveling because your environment has completely changed but you don't yeah. need to go roll a survival check you know roll exactly. another one roll another one roll another one yeah totally and that's something that i've done with when the grass the last game of curse of strata done this week actually um wait that no, was last week this is only wednesday um but it was Basically, I gave a wee rumour. I was desperate for the players to go to this location. Um, and I kind of... St- I'm not going to say where it is. I, no, well, for those, you'll just forget this if we ever run it. If I ever run it for you guys. But there's a location in Cursor Strad called uh, the Ruins of Berez. Or Berez. Um, and I wanted the players to go there. and thought, they're never going there, ever. But I just thought, you know what, after they did all this stuff, I was like, just drop in. They deserve, they deserve a wee award. So I was like, oh, they, I heard this little rumour. And I was like, okay, they'll maybe peg that and go later. And they went, actually, we want to go there now. And I was like, oh, God, I've not prepped anything. Why did I do that? But I actually used travel. Now, I did make them roll on a table, but and they did end up getting an encounter. But I actually used, rather than making that an encounter, because I wanted them to just get there, mm-hmm. I used it as a thing to kind of illustrate there was some looming threat nearby and it ran away. And it was a random encounter, so I don't think it'll ever come back. But when they got to the location, I actually used that opportunity to, as they travelled there, I actually used the environment to tell a lot of the storytelling. Mm-hmm. And definitely a way to spice up your travel would be to use it for foreshadowing what might come up. And I actually mm-hmm. just thinking about it, I've used that quite a lot. I maybe need to stop using it as much because <laughs> people will pick up on the pattern if I keep doing it. But I used it in this case for foreshadowing kind of some of the looming threat that was nearby. None of it was overt. 
but I suppose the bonus with Curse of Strahd is a lo- everywhere has a looming threat, but at least I used it to describe this unique location that was battle-scarred mm-hmm. and beaten by previous wars that had been in that area or whatever it was that happened there. Um, so that's definitely somewhere to something you can do to rather than if, if you don't want to have an encounter or if, maybe if you're short on time it's a great way to help still portray a cool story almost pad out your world without padding out the time mm-hmm. um, and it makes it look like you know what you're doing I mean most of the games I ran for that big year long campaign that I've just paused were based off of like 10 bullet points maximum and they're like how do you do this Jordan there's so much lore and I went it's a secret and the secret was I don't have a flaming clue what I'm doing um, and then I write about it later um, but I think the last main thing to spice up games is I mentioned I do like storytelling during these times or maybe foreshadowing again I've mentioned uh, but I loop all that into if I'm playing a cosmic game which I was touching on before I side jumped there I use it for maybe an opportunity for during sleep I use it for visions Mm-hmm. No, I've seen travelling like doing watches at, at night so you can actually do some environmental story, storytelling or others but I usually might I might have events happen during the night maybe not directly impacting players but maybe they get a dream about something that had happened mm-hmm. recently or maybe it's a warning or if this player was cursed by some cosmic entity or some uh, infernal dwelling beast in the cult divinity lost lore maybe that's mm-hmm. trying to reach them or maybe it's, it would actually be the dream um, world, I can't remember what it's called in cult but there's like a dream plane type thing so maybe that's where some of those entities are reaching out to them in a dream might not have any consequences yet but it's a way to foreshadow it and tell a story and almost allude to some of the threats that they might see coming up so travelling and even the bits of travel that's really quote unquote boring like sleeping mm-hmm. they can all be used for awesome storytelling mechanics and I think that's probably some of the best ways you can spice it up you know, you could use tables and encounters to spice up your travel, but the reality is you're going to, the more you play games, if you've not played already, you get that quite a lot. So sometimes there's these other tools that you can mix and match with that mm-hmm. to just make it feel like really unique travel experiences instead of the cardinal sin that I experienced last week, which was roll, okay, you're fine. Roll again, roll again, roll again. Yeah. Two hours later, are we done yet? Oh, yes. And it was like, okay, you're in combat. And I went, oh. Yeah, and I mean, I think something that you said there, which is kind of important to touch on as well, is that we've spent kind of a lot of time since the start of this episode saying, basically, whatever you do, don't repeat the survival checks and the things that become repetitive because it it just becomes a grind for players and it becomes something that they could you know, as soon as you as soon as you mention it you'll spot them all just sighing or sinking or you know, yeah. you spot something or hopefully you spot something that lets you know that alright, okay, this is maybe repeating itself too much. Um but you were saying about using like a dream or or, or a vision or, or something it's something unique and something creative to then change the direction of the story or to kind of give it a bit more momentum in a particular way or, you know, whatever it or is. Or guidance. Or guidance, guidance yeah, if really players are starting to drift away from the story and kind of lose the thread or if they're... Lost? It's, yeah, lost if they're going down, if it's a kind of more investigative type story and they're, they're, they're going down the wrong track the, to get them back and to point them in the right direction doing something like that is great because it's it's different and chances are not a lot of them will be expecting it when you drop it in so you'll catch some of them out by surprise you'll you know it will do a lot of positive things but if you do that on game one and then in game four or five and this campaign you do it again and then in game six or seven you do it again and that happens a lot and that starts to happen frequently rather than the players being particularly bored of it or finding it you know not entertaining anymore it loses its impact and it loses the surprise factor it loses the kind of 
the importance, you know, if you're using it as, again, like Jordan was saying, as guidance or something like that, divine intervention, you know, whatever, then it starts to lose that impact and it becomes ordinary and it starts to get not ignored because I don't, well, fingers crossed your players aren't ignoring what you're telling them when you're there, yeah. but it isn't immediately obvious and clear that something unique or something special is happening. So you can you can bore players with the mechanics by repeating that too often, but you can also diminish impact by over-repeating something that had an impact at some point. And it's just kind of... It's just unfortunately that more, like you've said previously, doesn't necessarily mean more all the time. Yeah, I think almost the secret to it is actually we've maybe gave our takes and things, but and and some of the examples in other games that spice up traveling. But ultimately, if you only use one of those tools, no matter how often you used it, or how not often you <laughs> infrequently you used it, it's still it's going to get it's going to get stale. So a cocktail is always really nice. Um, I mentioned even dreams for like foreboding or maybe in part as part of your travel you might use it as like kind of foreshadowing a threat but think out of the box you might if it's a Cthulhu game for example and it's sanity based you might want to use it as a way to try and eat at the player you might use environment the environment to kind of make it sound like it's really evil to the player maybe all these birds or the, the creaking trees is making this guy see shadows in the environment even though there is none and it isn't really foreshadowing anything either but it's a way to start actually integrating your players' characters into the environment in ways that it connects to them. Um, there's so many ways that you can do that. Um, it's definitely just that's a whole. There's a whole bunch of different stuff. So don't even any of the standard tools. Try and even um, what's it called when you associate like a meaning like if you get see the moon smiles or something. I can't remember the phrase now. I've forgot my higher English, and um, because I've not used it so long. Metaphor. No, not a metaphor. It's when you give it uh, onomatopoeic, say... Uh, anthropomorphic. Anthropomorphic, yeah. yeah. If you can do that with your environment, it's almost to, it's almost to represent some of your players' journeys. I mean, th- even think about it that abstract, if it suits your game. But I would say, regardless of the tool you're using, it's probably good it's one that always seems to make a bit of sense to bring in. Don't just throw it in for no reason. Mm-hmm. Like, throw in a dream. Oh, there's an evil monster in your dream. Oh, my God. If that doesn't mean anything to that player's character at that point, then it's kind of a bit pointless adding it. You could have just skipped it anyway. Mm-hmm. Whereas if they've seen a murder, let's say it's Cthulhu, and they've seen a murder, maybe they dream about it that night when they're on the train to the next town, you know, mm-hmm. uh, and maybe they see a silhouette of someone and it could be that guy that they spoke to before, but maybe it's not. You know, maybe it's someone else entirely or maybe it's their partner who's actually going to backstab them from their backstory, you know. Mm-hmm. There's loads of ways you can make it really interesting, but think outside the box. And I would just say, just to sign off almost, have fun with it and just try stuff. If it doesn't work, your players probably won't notice, you know. They'll mm-hmm. see it as a wee bit of storytelling. Assuming it's not an encounter and you're doing it as a narrative piece, they'll see it as a wee narrative piece and that's all. But if you land the mark, you'll see them getting grossed and engaged yeah. and that's all within five minutes rather than having a 30 minute fight you know and there is places for fights too mm-hmm. but you know the only thing I would just say is just especially fights try not to use them too much because otherwise it just becomes a slog or a slug fest mm-hmm. um, but I um, I think that's all my closing thoughts um, is there anything you want to add before you take us to the sign off uh, again just kind of echoing pretty much a lot of what Jordan's saying there. I mean, the main thing to try and remember with travel is that in order to emphasise scale to your players, in order to emphasise importance or to to make it something epic or grand, you don't need to go through it second by second, yeah. minute by minute, hour okay. by hour. You can, you can still give them a lot to do over the journey you can still have a lot of things happening over the journey but you know if if you're planning and doing like the travel section over a game then if you split it down to three or four main events or three or four main situations and you go right well if the journey is going to take an hour 
to complete the hen. Well, take that hour, divide it up. And that's what's happening in each of those parts. If there's a journey that's taking a week, then well, that's every couple of days something's happening. Or if it's a month, then it's once a week something's happening and, and so on and so on and so on. So the bigger the journey, the less you should be focusing on the, the minute details of what's happening when it comes to time. And yeah. the more you should be focused on the bigger events, the the kind of checkpoints along the journey or or whatever else it is that you decide to do. But to me that's the main thing. Don't or try not to fall in the trap of breaking it down to too minute fine. detail. Yeah. Uh, and that was a perfect example of that when we spoke about the travelling and the letters mm. and things. I would also say as well, maybe you might opt in terms of when if you do break stuff down it's also okay to have nothing happen and just skip past it. So just yeah. bear that in mind, especially if time's tight. Um, that's totally okay too because at least if you go for that, you're not going to reduce the effectiveness of maybe what might happen next time. Yeah. So just keep that in mind. It's always yeah. worth thinking yeah. about. Yeah, and again, that's the thing like we talked about earlier as well. Yeah. If, you're, if you're going through an area where the environment's changing, well, you don't need the players necessarily to be doing anything, but if you go into some detail about how the environment's changing and if you become more descriptive at that point, then you can emphasise, again, scale, time and all sorts of different things there by just physically what the players are seeing and what the characters are experiencing at that point by letting them know how it's changed. Yeah, um, that's exactly what I did in the Strad and actually I'm glad I did that instead of uh, the fight encounter because the guys went into that whole area going, what the hell is this? <laughs> and it was great. It's actually one of the funnest little games I've done recently and it was also the kickstart in Strad again. But I, anyway, so that's some of our takes. Um, I would actually say, for anyone listening or watching, we'd love to know what your thoughts are on this. Uh, yep. I've, we've, we've spoke about, we've already asked you what your encounters have been like. Have you ever been or had a really unique experience that you would like to share? Is there anything that we've said you can like, I don't actually like the sound of that. I think we should fight every time we want to travel. Let us know. Well, I would respectfully disagree with that just because I've played fighting to death. Um, no pun intended, but we'd love just to hear what different opinions are because that's what helps us evolve these opinions and maybe we'll revisit travelling when I decide that actually maybe writing letters and having two hours about how someone responds to a letter is a good idea. <laughs> I doubt it, but... Yeah, um, I so I think from me then, it's a thanks for listening. Yeah, and thanks from me as well, and you can let us know any of your opinions as well. If you're on YouTube watching us, then there's comments down below. We've also got different social media channels that we'll have, hopefully linked in different description boxes, wherever you are, whether it's on YouTube or whether you're listening on Spotify or another podcast. We'll have things out there. So there's Facebook, there's Twitter, there's a Discord server there as well if you want to get in touch. And there's an Instagram there as well. Great. Okay, so once again... Thanks for listening or watching and we'll catch you on the next episode.